Hello and welcome to another alumni office interview. I'm delighted to welcome current DCU student, uh, Aidan Minnick, who's superintendent in Atlone Garda Station. Uh, and as I said, current student at DCU. Aidan, you're working full time and you're trying to complete your executive MBA studies. Uh, a busy time, no doubt. Yeah, certainly very busy, Ross. Um, thankfully, we have uh, the last few assignments have been submitted and now we're on to our final pieces of work, leadership development piece and our capstone project. So thankfully we're coming to the end, but certainly has been a busy period over the last number of weeks. Yeah, well, as, as you mentioned, leadership and leadership skills, uh, I guess you very kindly shared a couple of photographs that will very much demonstrate how you and your team have been working over the past 10 weeks or so. Uh, the first photograph there, Aidan, is probably something that most of us have seen out on the roads as, as you try to keep us safe during the, the lockdown, although things are starting to ease now, which is, which is very welcome too. Yeah, certainly this is, I suppose, a, a very common image now for people across the country, Gary and checkpoints, and I suppose it's the actual, um, the practical element of our adjustments to our policing plans and our revised strategy, which is, I suppose, really to uh, reduce the spread of COVID-19 across the country. And one of the measures we, we took is uh, a lot of checkpoints, a lot of community engagement. And uh, I suppose that's all through our principles. We have four guiding principles, really, of um, engaging with the community, encouraging uh, a compliance with the COVID-19 guidelines, educating people surrounding us, and then enforcement really is a last resort. So this is, I suppose, as you say, Ross, a very typical picture of what's happening in the communities at the moment. Yeah, and I guess there's, there's lots of different elements to it. If we, if we look at another, another side of it, apart from the enforcement and ensuring that people are, I suppose, are re we're really only venturing outside of their houses for essential journeys, this shows um, you and your team in a totally different light. And the work that you're doing to really help people less fortunate in the community. Yeah, I suppose this is probably illustrates some of the collaboration that's happened in the last while between the public services and the private industries who are collaborating together to help people, I suppose, who are at risk. And the image here is shown where um, a pharma pharmacy has volunteered some supplies um, to deliver to people at risk among the community and then the guards are collecting those supplies and then we'll do dispatches around the community to the vulnerable people, to elderly, uh, and give them necessary, I suppose, medication, along with some personal protection equipment that will help them along their daily lives. Yeah, and, and I guess there, it, it was a case that um, at, the, at the beginning of, of COVID-19, there was probably a great need for, for guards to, to be out and making sure that the essential journeys and so on were, were adhered to. What was the general feeling like in the community, Aidan? I guess if you're, you're delivering groceries to, to people who are in the high risk category and so on, there must have been a huge sense of uh, relief and uh, gratitude to the guards for rolling up their sleeves and, and really helping them in their hour of need. Yeah, look, it was a great, um, we certainly got um, great feedback in relation to it, but um, I think the morale actually among the guards significantly uh, increased as a result of because they were engaging with the community, giving back to the community, and I suppose that's what the guards love to do. Um, so I suppose the, the normal day-to-day -day business in relation to, I suppose, preventing and detecting crime, um, the demand for that decreased, and as part of the new, I suppose, uh, policing plan in relation to preventing the spread of COVID-19 and helping people in vulnerable positions. Um, certainly Gardaí, I suppose, uh, enjoyed that work and were happy to get out into the community and it seemed to work very well. Yeah, and I guess behind the scenes in Garda stations, as we'll see from our next photograph, that uh, obviously it wasn't just uh, your work in the communities and, and so on that's so visible. There has been a huge, huge, huge restructuring, even in terms of the safety inside of Garda stations, of course, for the members of the public, but also for, for your own team. Maybe tell us a little bit about what that was like, because that's always not too visible when, when we think of the Garda, all of that work that goes on at an administrative level within the stations. Yeah, I suppose, as you mentioned, Rosh, that there was a large amount of restructuring. Um, firstly, I suppose, across the organisation, 
the biggest restructuring piece was there was a new roster implemented at the start of our uh, response to COVID-19 where we brought the units from five down to four. Um, so that was a significant readjustment where Gardaí are now working on four on four 12-hour shifts in a row. And as part of that restructuring then, in addition to that, I suppose, locally then there was a restructuring where guards from at Lone Station were reallocated out to some of the more uh, rural stations. And that was a measure, I suppose, to have contingency teams in place if there was uh, a case of people getting infected in at Lone that we had reserve teams out in other guard stations step in. So that was um, uh, additional restructuring. And I suppose the pictures here show as well some of the physical restriction within the Garda station. Um, the picture on the left is actually the custody area where prisoners or arrested persons come into the Garda station and they're checked in. And you can see the, there's a screen there between where the guard uh, enters details both on the pulse system and into the logbook there. And the, the prisoner then uh, with a hatch there to hand in property and possessions while the person is detained. And some of the the physical restriction there on the right is just a canteen which has been done across businesses and organizations around the country where we just had to implement social distancing guidelines within our canteens and within how we do our business so that i suppose changed even morning meetings daily briefings etc um all of that has changed as well with a with a significant restriction across the whole organization yeah and i might ask you about that Specifically, Aidan, I guess for your, your daily debriefs, a lot of those would have been done with the team uh, in public and so on, uh, or in, in person. Ha, has a lot of the change gone to, gone to email? And how has that, from a leadership perspective, changed your role? I'm conscious of your, you're doing the MBA. There's a massive um, leadership focus on that. And was there transferable skills that you could take from your studies that, and implement them as superintendent in your day to day? Yeah, I, I certainly have presented leadership challenges um, because part of leadership, as we're all aware, is that physical meeting people and uh, I suppose delivering the message and reiterating that message. And that communication piece is so vital to getting the job done. So I suppose that certainly presented challenges and we had to deliver a lot of messages by email. But I suppose at the end of the day, the, we tried to divide up the teams that I suppose I meet the next level down to me the sergeants and inspectors that's who I meet and I suppose I don't at the moment get the opportunity to meet guards as much as I'd like and as much as I used to so those messages are delivered delivered down the down the line but the reality is the guards understand why and they understand the requirements that are there to, and why the entire team is not meeting so it's working and uh, Garda responded more to emails because that's the way to communicate at the moment. So those measures have worked well, but it certainly has presented challenges. Yeah, and maybe one thing when, when the rest of us were trying to adhere to the, the lockdown measures and, and so on and following the advice from the HSC and, and the government, uh, conscious as well that life ch has changed hugely for, for the guards. And uh, as you say, where maybe styles of communication and how you actually go about your your day-to-day -day changes what has it been like from a policy implementation perspective um you, you mentioned earlier on that you had the change their policing plan in essence what does what does that mean for the, for the team like you've got 120 people reporting to you and and for you as a, as a leader that you have a lot of big decisions to make in terms of staff self-isolating and so on yes um, I suppose there has been a lot of um, changes around, I suppose, the entire business requires, I suppose, that there's a 24-7 service. So it's making decisions surrounding how we can maintain that 24-7 service and having contingency measures in place in the event, as you have mentioned there, Ross, that there is a need for people to self-isolate. And we've had many uh, of those situations where due to exposures in the workplace, guards have needed to self-isolate. So I suppose the initial steps we took in relation to allocating people out to some of the rural stations, having contingency teams, having guards working in pairs, uh, which they normally would operate in a bigger unit, whereas now they're kind of divided into pairs, working with a particular guard in the patrol car for the entire uh, period. So those measures, I suppose, have allowed us to make sure that in the event of those uh, occasions where guards are self-isolating that we still have contingency teams to step in 
um, and we've had to do that uh, across the the weeks, the days. So those measures have worked. Yeah, and a huge um, it's a huge machine in, in in the background to try and try and make those um, policy changes and and structural changes as well. If I might show one more one more photo again, Aidan, that reminds us that regardless of COVID nineteen, uh, that's one aspect of 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 um, your work that has obviously come to the to the forefront. But uh, crime is still every bit uh, part of your focus as well, and you share two two photos here that will give us a real insight into that. Yeah, I suppose the, the image on the left there shows an interview room uh, with a, a screen between the detained person and that's a video recorded interview um, with the arrested person sitting on the, the, the far chair and the Garda interview and sitting uh, on the near chair and the screen in between. So that, that business continues to happen. And I suppose, as, as you rightly said, the business of criminality continues and I suppose arrests and detect detections are still happening and that image on the right then shows a detection in a grow house which happened last month in Athlone where over a hundred thousand pounds worth of cannabis was seized in, the, in that particular grow house. So um, a lot of, well some areas of and categories of crime has decreased over the period. There certainly is uh, still a lot of criminality happening I suppose so we have a diversion of our uh, response on our policing plans, but still we had to keep our focus on the primary goals of Angarish Economy, preventing and detecting crime, uh, traffic, etc. Those areas. Aidan, thank you for that insight into into the I suppose the crime aspect that uh, is still part of your your everyday life, and it's fantastic to see the the mix and uh, I suppose the transformation of Angarish Economy in relation to COVID nineteen, where you have this uh, where you have a lot of the extra pressures in, in terms of the lockdown and enforcement, but also uh, the role that you carry, that you identified earlier on and, and helping people who are in those high risk categories and then combining that with the day to day of where you, where you, you, you outlined the, the recent drug seizure. In terms of, of for you, what has been your, your biggest challenge as a, as a leader over the last um, 12 weeks? Uh, a totally changed world from from our time previous to that. Well, I suppose the the initial challenge was certainly in the first few weeks, uh, where there was a complete uh, redirection in relation to our strategy and our planning. So I suppose that required required revised district policing plans uh, to basically mobilise the entire team. And as you mentioned there earlier, Ross, you know, a team of over 120 people with with support staff and. The initial steps for myself is really to mobilize those pe people so they knew exactly the requirements, what our refocus was during this pandemic and how we were going to achieve those objectives. Um, so once um, I suppose that happened and we got people in this uh, new way of working, realigned rosters, reallocating to new stations. So those first two or three weeks were particularly busy um, and there was a lot of communication to be done, a lot of messaging to do, and with the additional challenges of not being able to meet people to, to do that delivery of messages. So that was certainly the biggest challenge. But I suppose, like everyone, I suppose we've all adapted to this new this new reality, and I suppose guards have adapted very quickly to this new way of policing and our new strategic focus. So those initial steps and, and, were and, the big and, challenge. And just on the, the I suppose the, the new focus and so on. What has it been? Has it been like uh, personally to? Obviously, I'm sure a lot of people in, in society have been uh, a great help in complying with what, um, what you've been trying to do. In scenarios where you're maybe trying to understand and be empathetic towards people feeling the need to get out and so on, has it been difficult to combat or to combine that with um, some people just simply not being of, of, of a help? Yeah, well, I suppose one of the big challenges has certainly been striking that balance. And I suppose the, the minister um, has introduced significant measures for Angarda Shikana within the new Health Act. Uh, they have wide sweeping powers, but it's a matter of striking the balance uh, with the powers that we have and the discretionary element of enforcing those powers. So, and then it's a matter of communicating that message to all the Gardaí who are on the ground actually implementing those powers to show that we, we have a message really of an 
trying to encourage and engage with the community as the first step. Educate people then who are non-compliant and trying to, whether that's in industries or at checkpoints, and then really the final step has been enforcement. And as you have mentioned there, Ross, people have been very compliant. People have wanted to cooperate with the government guidelines, and thankfully that has been, and really the last resort of enforcement uh, has been only handful on, happened on a few occasions. And in, I guess just to, to finish off, thank you for, for giving us that brilliant insight. Back to your executive MBA studies at DCU uh, for the minute. What's the next uh, couple of months? You're finished at the end of July. Uh, you have a lot of responsibility. You have a young family at home and you're, you're trying to keep us safe uh, out there on, on the streets and in society as well. How are you getting time to mix in all of your assignments and, and deadlines? Yeah, it's been a challenge, certainly has been a challenge. But uh, I suppose for me at the outset, I suppose there was very much in DCU a seamless transition um, to restructuring the lectures that we didn't have to attend and we could do them online. And I suppose in relation to the, the final piece now, it's really, I'm not spending time on the road. And when I am, I suppose at home, I get to actually get stuck into the final pieces of work that I have to do. So. Certainly going to be busy month ahead, um, two months really. But um, look, it'll like everything. When there's a deadline looming, um, we'll, we'll focus on it and get it done. So. Well, Aidan, thank you very much for for your time. It's a fascinating insight into uh, all that uh, incorporates a, a day for for members of Angardashi Akana. Uh, you're a fine student of DCU. We are incredibly proud of your achievements as a superintendent. And we very much look forward to uh, welcome you, welcoming you to the alumni community after you complete your, your executive MBA. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for Thanks very much. You and for also keeping us safe on the front line. Very much appreciated. Thank you very much, Ross. Very much appreciated.